Welcome to the Healthy Heart Show, where we pull back the curtain on conventional medicine and dive into the root causes of cardiovascular health. If you are concerned about high cholesterol, high blood pressure, heart attacks, stroke, or atrial fibrillation, this is the place for you. We will provide natural heart information that will help you prevent, treat, and reverse any ailment, leaving pills and procedures out of the picture. Here are your guides to holistic heart health, board-certified cardiologist and Amazon best-selling author, Dr. Jack Wolfson, and natural heart doctor, naturopathic physician, Dr. Lauren Latanza. Hello, everyone. Dr. Jack Wolfson, cardiologist, natural heart doctor. Welcome to another episode of the Healthy Heart Show, where we focus on the 100-year heart cardiac longevity, making sure, again, you've got your heart and your brain with you for over 100 years. And we bring on the best of the best guests to give us just new and, and useful information, and we'll present some science and obviously practicality. And I want to introduce to you Dr. Paul Saladino. Paul, great to see you. Thanks for having me on, Jack. Good to be here. You know, uh, so so I first uh, heard about Paul a few uh, years ago, or actually you know, a couple of years ago, as I started kind of delving into carnivore, and we were doing some carnivore challenges with our patients. And imagine that cardiologist talking about carnivore nutrition with patients and, and how amazing it was. But uh, I'll tell you what, you know, you've got a very impressive bio and some cool stuff going on as well. I'm going to let Dr. Lauren Latanza take over from here and uh, jump right into your intro. All right. My pleasure to introduce Dr. Saladino. He is the leading authority on the science and application of the carnivore diet and animal based diets. He has used these diets to reverse autoimmune issues, chronic inflammation, and mental health issues in hundreds of patients, many of whom had been told their conditions were untreatable. He is the author of the best-selling book, The Carnivore Code, which I have with me right here, and the host of the top 10 podcast, Fundamental Health. He can be found featured on numerous podcasts, including The Joe Rogan Experience, Meat Eater, The Minimalists, Health Theory, The Model Health Show, Bulletproof Radio, The Dr. Gundry Podcast, the Ben Greenfield podcast, Dr. Mercola, and many others. He has also appeared on the Doctor's TV show and on many other prominent media outlets. Dr. Saladino is a board certified as a physician, nutrition specialist, and completed residency at the University of Washington. He attended medical school at the University of Arizona, where he focused on integrative medicine and nutritional biochemistry. When he's not researching the roots of chronic illness, he can be found in wild places in search of the perfect wave, sunset, and mountaintop. He lives in Austin, Texas. Welcome, Dr. Saladino. Good to be here. All right, so just roll right into some questions we have for you, if that's all right with you. So um, regarding the carnivore diet, what evidence there for the critical role of meat and the progression of us as humans in history? The, the anthropology, the ethnography of humans is, is so fascinating. And this is, you know, I, I feel like they should have taught us all this in medical school and, and they did it right. Like this is not the type of thing taught in medical school, like where humans have come from and uh, what humans looked like 2 million years ago or 4 million years ago. And it's just, it's a fascinating story. And what, what you learn looking at our, our history as humans from the fossil record and stable isotopes from bone fragments and currently living hunter gatherers is that there's been this progression of humans. You know, we have these ancestors who had much smaller brains and somewhere around 2 million years ago, we suddenly see a massive increase in the size of the human brain. It's, it's a really a parabolic type curve. It's an exponential increase over the last two million years from around 500 cc to 1500 cc in, in size. So it essentially triples in two million years <clears throat> after you know 60 to 90 million years of having a brain that was the same size in our primate ancestors. And so it's a really interesting story, like what caused that? And there are lots of theories, but I think that clearly the most compelling explanation is we changed something in our diet and we changed something in our lifestyle. And what we started doing was hunting. And there's so much good evidence for this in the fossil record. There's cut marks on bones. There's evidence for 
these what are called the Shulian tools, these bifacial tools that happened 2 million years ago. There's wounding marks on the bones of animals. There's mass graves of animals that were sort of herded off um, large cliffs. And then, you know, we see changes in our hominid ancestors. We see, like I said, a brain that is growing based on the cranial vault size. We see uh, a small intestine, which is growing, and a large intestine, which is shrinking. This is all kind of talked about as the expensive tissue hypothesis, this idea that as we transition from primates to humans, uh, going from Australopithecus to Homo habilis and Homo erectus and eventually Homo sapiens, we see this massive colon, this massive large intestine that primates have shrinking and the small intestine where a lot of the more nutrient-rich foods are absorbed, growing. And that energetic trade-off allows for a growing brain because you have sort of this, uh, this very energy-intensive brain that needs to have a caloric surplus from somewhere. So you have all of this energy and digestion that gets saved when you eat more nutrient-rich foods, which are animal foods, and then you can grow a brain. And there are unique nutrients in these animal foods. And this is something that's not also not talked about in medical school. This idea that if you look at plant foods, uh, I believe that, that a human could construct a healthy diet that includes moderate amounts of plant foods. And we'll probably get to what I think of as a hierarchy of plant foods later on in this podcast. But if you look at plant foods, there are, there are nutrients in plant foods that humans can absorb. But compared to animal foods, they really pale in comparison, which is the irony because the mainstream messaging is that plant foods are, are the savior, right? If you're, if you're sick, all you need to do is eat more kale. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you have gut issues, all you should do is eat more fiber. That's clearly the answer. It's just that you're not eating enough plants, that you're eating too much meat, and you're not eating enough fiber. And my message has actually been completely opposite of that. And when you look at the actual nutrients in animal foods, it's fascinating to discover that there are so many nutrients in animal foods that do not occur in plant foods in any appreciable quantity that are critical to being an optimal human. Things like creatine, uh, choline, carnosine, carnitine, the list goes on and on, anserine, taurine, coenzyme Q10, biotin, folate, riboflavin. These are, these are critical to make a healthy human. I mean, there are studies with vegetarians, which are incredibly striking, where you can take vegetarians or vegans and you can supplement them with five grams of creatine per day, and they get smarter. <laughs> they get smarter. I mean, creatine is used in our brain as this phosphate carrier, and we know that when humans are deficient in creatine, we are not at our peak intelligence. We're also not at our peak muscle performance, and we're not going to be at a peak anything, really. And this is true across the board with so many of these nutrients. Choline, which is used to make acetylcholine, and then phosphatidylcholine in all the cell membranes of your body. Deficiencies of choline are hugely problematic and connected with things like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and, uh, you know, mental health issues and the list goes on and on. So, you know, you could look at every single one of those nutrients and think, oh, okay, like, why are we told that, why are we told that kale is a superfood when in fact, I don't know what criteria they're using to do that. Like meat is the real superfood. Meat and organs is, is, are the real superfoods. It's not to say that plants can't have a role in a healthy diet, but there are some caveats there. So evolutionarily, this idea that, that meat and the consumption of meat and organs and hunting was the spark that made us human is, is a thesis that I've advanced in my work. And when you think about it that way, all of these notions that we should not eat meat or that meat is harming humans start to look very, very silly. They just, why would that make sense? That makes absolutely no sense evolutionarily. And then we start to see the studies that indict meat or that denigrate meat in a different light. And we can understand like, oh, of course, there's this is all epidemiology and we can get into why the, the science regarding meat is so misleading. But when you think about it evolutionarily, meat is crucial for humans, always has been, always will be. It's what made us human, meat and organs. And there's so much evidence for that. Yeah, that's fantastic stuff, you know, Paul. And again, we're talking with Dr. Paul Saladino, author of The Carnivore Code. If you have not gotten the book, you have to get a copy of it. And, you know, I, I wrote the, when I wrote the book, The Paleo Cardiologist and all about paleo nutrition, paleo lifestyle, we talk about so many of these same things. Number one, how the medical doctors are not getting any training in nutrition uh, and in lifestyle and certainly not in anthropology and paleontology and, and evolutionary biology. It almost seems like, you know, Paul, we get indoctrinated right from day one as far as like okay here's here's the farm here are the pharmaceuticals here's the surgical procedures here's the tests we can order 
Uh, and, and again, just don't get so many of these fundamentals. And it would have been nice if they would have grounded us kind of early on in that. But, you know, what I love about your book is that, you know, because in the paleocardiologist, I talk about all the benefits of, of meat and of organs and certainly of seafood, but I don't really get into the plant uh, bashing. And I love that's what you do. You and, and not only do you bash it, but you've got just like pages and pages of, of references of why you're doing so. And then to look at it through the lens of, hey, maybe everything we've been told about plants is is wrong or at least can be questioned. That's really the, the beauty of your book, I think. Well, thank you. I mean, I I think that there are there are certainly some assumptions that we have in the nutritional world that I've called into question. And I, and I like the way you phrase that, Jack. Like, I think it's okay to question these assumptions and ask ourselves, why do we assume that plants are good for us? Let's let's think about this. So at the beginning of the podcast, I, I tried to create a framework through which we should see human nutrition and optimal human health. And that framework is this evolutionary, anthropological, paleoanthropological context. And if we look at an optimal human diet, or we ask questions about what might be an optimal human diet through the same lens, with the same framework, things start to come out or interesting questions arise, which is, so I was talking two to four million years ago. If we rewind the clock even further, much further, and we go 450 million years ago, that's when we start to see the the sort of uh, the divergence of plants and animals evolutionarily. And this idea that um, that, that the plants and animals have coexisted for millions and millions of years, many, many years, and that plants are rooted in the ground and plants are intelligent. There's no question about it. Plants are incredible. Um, anyone that's studied botany, I mean, the, the, the lengths that plants go to, to, to interact with animals is fascinating. In fact, I was just, I just heard on a podcast recently that there are plants that can hear the the, the frequency of a bee's wing. And what they will do is when they hear this wing of a bee, they will increase the amount of, of nectar in their flowers to try and entice a bee to come in. So plants have this incredible evolutionary intelligence within them. And similarly, you can, you can take a plant and when the plant hears, and I'm not making this up, when the plant hears the sound of a caterpillar eating its leaves, it will increase the amount of defense chemicals in those leaves by to dissuade the caterpillars. And so what they've actually done is they've played a recording of a caterpillar eating leaves of a plant to a plant, and the plant increases the amount of toxins in their leaves to dissuade the caterpillar from eating them. So how incredible is this, right? So think about what plants have done over 450 million years of coevolution with animals. And they've had to make defense chemicals because plants don't want most of their, their foliage to get eaten. They don't really want their leaves to get eaten by animals. They don't want their stems or their roots or their bark or their seeds, and we can talk about that, especially to be eaten by animals. So in order to coexist, in order to create this incredible ecosystem, these ecosystems we see around us, plants have out of necessity evolved defense chemicals. But again, this is not something that we are told in medical school. It's not completely foreign because there's lots of examples of this. I don't know if you guys heard this growing up, but when I was growing up, you know, whenever there were kids around at Christmas, my parents were always like, make sure the toddlers don't eat the poinsettias, the poinsettias, you know, these like red, these like really bright red leaves of these plants that probably look like a strawberry to a toddler, but they're frankly toxic. Like you cannot eat a poinsettia leaf, but around Christmas, we have these plants and, you know, people would say like, don't let people eat, they're toxic. And like, you know, rhubarb leaves are frankly toxic because they have so much oxalic acid in them. So there are examples of poisonous plants, but we don't, we, we, I think that we've forgotten how far this rabbit hole goes, like how long this thread is. Basically, most plants have, devol have evolved, have devised these intelligent strategies to put defense chemicals in all of the parts of their body that they don't want to get eaten. And so I kind of, I had a lot of fun in the book digging into that and understanding what we know, you know, what are the, these defense chemicals? And a lot of them are things that we've thought of as good for us. And we can talk about sulforaphane or some of these other examples or curcumin. And some of these are actually defense chemicals that are in plants that may have 
harm-inducing possibilities in humans. Now, I should frame this whole discussion a little bit further and say that all of these, these detoxification systems in the liver, these phase one and phase two, these canonical detoxification systems in our livers probably evolved in response to plant toxins. That's why we have phase one and phase two, the CYP450 systems you know, in our bodies in response to these plant toxins. So we have some intrinsic ability to detoxify these plant chemicals, but we need to be very honest about what we're dealing with here, which are plant defense chemicals, which in many people could be at the root of underlying issues or leading to suboptimal health. So in the book, I, I'll talk about a, a lot of different divisions of these plant chemicals. I talk into how there are many polyphenolic molecules, a buzzword that's been associated with health that I think could be harmful for humans. I talk about lectins, which are carbohydrate binding proteins. And you know, the, the most famous lectin is perhaps gluten and gliadin, these fragments of wheat that are hugely you know, problematic for humans and are known to open these tight junctions in our guts by activating these pathogen-associated molecular patterns at the level of our gut epithelium. I mean, gluten is a lectin. There are also tons of other lectins in beans. Uh, you know, the most common one is called phytohemagglutinin, which is massively problematic for humans. So that's nuts and seeds and beans and grains are full of these lectins. And then you can go on and look at oxalic acid. That's the rhubarb example I gave. There are documented cases of death from consumption of too much oxalic acid in plants, whether it's from sorrel in the wilderness or from rhubarb, you can kill yourself eating oxalic acid. Um, there's probably a lethal dose of spinach, which is one of the highest, you know, commonly eaten leafy greens of oxalic acid. Um, you'd have to eat a lot of it and you probably would get sick and vomit before you actually could get to that lethal dose, but it's probably out there. And then there's other defense chemicals in plants. There's so many of these, there's digestive enzyme inhibitors, but there's so many of these defense chemicals. But the whole framing is what I try and create at the start, which is plants don't want to get eaten. And, you know, I'm, I'm wearing a shirt right now that says, you know, kale is b You know, and I also joke and I say, kale doesn't love you back. So let's just, I'll give an example of the isothiocyanates in kale leaves, which will illustrate this. So isothiocyanates are a defense chemical in kale, cabbage, broccoli, collard greens, these are all the same species that have been kind of hybridized. And isothiocyanates are not polyphenolic, but they in some ways look similar, but they don't have any polyphenolic rims, rings if you look at the structure. But I'll, I'll, I'll ask people this question. So I hope to be able to have a conversation with Rhonda Patrick at some point um, and debate her on this. But you know, most people, if you ask them and you say, how much sulforaphane is in broccoli? Uh, many people will say like, well, I don't know, but it's, it's this amount. Or how much sulforaphane, which is this isothiocyanate chemical we've been told is so good for us, is in broccoli sprouts? And the answer is zero until you chew them, which really, I think, exposes the intention of plants. So sulforaphane is produced in a chemical reaction when its precursor molecule, which is called glucoraphanin, combines with an enzyme called myrosinase. And these are in separate compartments of the cell in a piece of broccoli or a piece of kale. So there's no sulforaphane in a kale leaf until you chew it. There's no sulforaphane in broccoli until you chew it. This is sort of like that, uh, that scene in, um, in Goonies where, you know, data is like, oh, booby traps. Like, I think of these as plant booby traps. This is almost like all super glue also. You have to combine two chemicals. You get this enzymatic uh, this enzyme, myrosinase, which combines with a precursor molecule, glucoraphanin, and then you get the trap is sprung. And clearly, this is what happens in the animal kingdom. The sulforaphane is not intended as a gift from the plants to the animals that are eating them. It's intended as a, hey, stop eating me, and by, if you eat me, I am going to inhibit absorption of iodine to the level of your thyroid, and if you eat enough of me, I'm going to stunt your growth, I'm going to make you infertile, and I'm going to completely mess up all of your physiology if you eat enough of my, my leaves because I put these defense chemicals. Now, sulforaphane is just one isothiocyanate. There are many others that are even more potent. And you can look at these. There's a great study looking at this. There's one called goitrin. There's one called allyl isothiocyanate. And goitrin is even more efficacious at inhibiting uh, iodine absorption at the level of the thyroid. There's a study that I talked about in the past that in levels of food consumed by humans, there's enough goitrin in like Brussels sprouts to actually meaningfully inhibit iodine absorption at the level of the thyroid, which could potentially lead to hypothyroidism. So this is these plants saying, get away from me, stop eating me. It's an example of a defense chemical. And 
I'll say this just so people have the whole story. One of the problems I have with the literature around these plant chemicals is it, it, it has a false assumption. And that false assumption they're making is that these plant chemicals are good for us or that plants are benevolent. And so from that framework, when these molecules are studied, they, will, they often will show only the benefits without talking about the harm. And so in the book, I make the case and say, can we really prove these molecules are a net benefit? But I want to be clear about the fact that there are studies with sulforaphane that show that it will have some benefits in humans. And this is where things get a little complicated, so bear with me. So sulforaphane, we've, we've heard, is, a, is an antioxidant, which is completely incorrect. Sulforaphane is a pro-oxidant. And if we actually dig into this, we can talk about what a pro-oxidant antioxidant is in terms of which direction the electrons are moving. It's not really that important, but suffice it to say that when sulforaphane enters your body, your body detoxifies it immediately. And it's a pro-oxidant, meaning it's gonna strip electrons from your molecules, creating free radicals and lipid peroxides. So forafane has been shown to do this. So forafane induces lipid peroxides in the membranes of cells. But how does your body respond to that? It, it, it turns on this enzymatic system, or I should say this transcriptional system with genes, including NRF2 and KEEP1, and it transcribes genes involved in the antioxidant response. So, so forafane is a pro-oxidant, and people have said that it may be beneficial because it's like a little bit of a poison. It's triggering your antioxidant system. And I've taken issue with this and said, actually, I'm not convinced it's really a net benefit because there are tons of studies that show that even in people who include lots of vegetables in their diet that are brassica vegetables, they don't have any better antioxidant status or any more uh, glutathione or any less oxidation of the molecules in their body uh, when they're eating those things compared to people who don't eat any vegetables. So this is a really interesting set of literature around the, the sort of the fallacy of vegetables being so good for us. So it really raises this question, like, are we really convinced that this is what we need to have optimal antioxidant status? I would argue no. And in the book, I talk about the fact that just by living a life that is well-lived, being in the sun, exercising, cold plunging, sauna, these are all hormesis-inducing inputs as well. But I make this delineation between environmental hormesis and molecular hormesis. That when you introduce a molecule like sulforaphane that you're claiming is a hormetic, you also have to remember that that molecule is going to have side effects. Like every drug that all of us were told to prescribe in medical school, we said these are the side effects, whether it's metoprolol, caridolol, whatever, a statin, we know there are side effects. But these plant molecules, we're never told about the side effects. And that's what I argue in the book. We're, we're, we've become uh, amnestic toward the, these side effects, these collaterally damaging side effects, these plant molecules. And I think that taken in, in total, the, it doesn't make sense that these molecules would be beneficial for us. Sure, you can show in an isolated study that if you give rats or you give human sulforaphane, you could increase the glutathione. But does that matter in the context of a healthy diet? And they're not looking at the way that the thyroid in these people might be decreasing. And so there's a, there's a kind of a, a really interesting story here to paint. I, I apologize for my long-windedness, but hopefully I was able to paint that picture for you guys. It's kind of a complex thing to explore. Well, no, but you really hit on it so well in the book, too. And again, just, uh, you know, the hundreds of references that you have in there explaining the science. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess at, at, its, at, its, at its root, really, it's a paradigm shifting book to get people to be able to think, hey, maybe plants don't have our best interests. Like you say, uh, you know, the, the broccoli isn't sitting there, you know, growing, thinking, hey, how can I help out the humans? Uh, how can I help, uh, you know, prevent cancer in humans and diabetes and heart disease and so on and so forth? And also, I will say this about your book, too. You are obviously a child uh, of the 80s. And again, like the references you tried out there. So I'm a few years older than you. But again, like that, you know, the references, you do put a lot of humor, even though obviously Dr. Paul is very, very, very intelligent and well read and uh, you know, it brings some hardcore science, you know, the, the, some of the levity to it as well. But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, once again, for people who want the deep dive on the science, it's all there. So, again, the, uh, you know, should you choose to impress your friends or even uh, convince, uh, you know, medical doctors as far as the right way to go, the science is there and, and you quote it so well. And you talk about how all these studies that are that are put out there, right? Uh, and talk about that, Paul, real quick, as far as epidemiological studies versus randomized trials and really how difficult it is in the food industry in general to come up with this, this uh, you know, randomized data. Yeah, this is such an important point. I spend a lot of time in the book explaining this. Um, 
No doubt your listeners have heard on the news repeatedly um, evidence from studies that says red meat is associated, keyword is associated, with worse cardiac outcomes or shorter life. And that word associated or correlated is never really talked about. Um, and it's a really important word because that doesn't mean they can't say causes. Because you can only say causes if you do an interventional study where you have a control group and you follow and you have an experimental group and you have two groups and you control their diet and one group eats more meat than the other group. And then you look at actual clinical outcome markers, whether it's CRP or atherosclerosis progression or any of these other markers, markers of insulin resistance. Now, those studies have been done and I'll talk about the results of those studies. But 99.9% .9 of what gets reported in the media is epidemiology. It's observational research. And they have to use these sort of sneaky words that say correlated or associated. And the problem with the type of research is something called, it's really twofold. There's two types of bias, healthy user bias and unhealthy user bias. And basically, you can think about it this way. What have we been told in the United States or in the Western world, broadly speaking, for the last 70 plus years about meat? We've been told it's bad for you. I mean, even, even here in Costa Rica, where I'm actually at right now, surfing, I was talking to an Argentinian the other day. And in Argentina, they eat a lot of meat. But you know, he was saying that when he talks to his friend about my work, they say, oh, bro, we love meat. But they almost think about it like a cigarette. They are going to eat meat because they love it so much, but they think about it like a bad thing. They say, everybody knows it's bad for you, but we're going to eat it anyway because we love it. And that's what's so confusing to us, right? That there is this perspective that meat is bad for us. And that's always based on these epidemiology studies. But when the general population believes that, who eats meat? It's people who might also smoke a cigarette, who are likely to ride a motorcycle and drink alcohol and you know, be doing shots of bourbon with their friends on a Friday night. And I'm not judging any of these other behaviors, but we know these other behaviors are associated with much worse outcomes and much overall worse uh, health behaviors in general. They're much less likely to exercise. They're much less likely to get general checkups, mammograms, prostate exams. You know, They're much less likely to see a doctor and, and look to see if they're insulin resistant. And key, they're more likely to eat junk food with their meat because we've been told meat is bad for us. So when was the last time that you, outside of your peer group, which I'm sure is very special, you know, when is the last time that the average American sees someone just eating meat? And not only meat, but like a grass-fed, grass-finished steak without a brownie, without something with seed oils. Never, you know, never. Right, never, without, right? Macar without macaroni and cheese that certainly has soybean oil in it. Like meat gets associated and blamed for all the things that it's often packaged with may actually be doing, and I believe are doing. So you go to McDonald's and nobody just gets the patty at McDonald's. I mean, your friends or my friends might, but 99.9% .9 of people get the, get the hamburger with the bun, with the wheat, with the special sauce, which has seed oils in it, with fries that are cooked in, in you know, soybean oil, and they're getting a massive dose of many things. Milk which I would argue, and exactly. soda pop and stuff like that. Totally. Processed sugars. Yeah. So this is why the unhealthy user bias is so misleading in these epidemiology studies. And the other side of the coin is you'll see evidence, you'll see epidemiology studies where they say a vegetarian diet is associated with better COVID outcomes or a vegetarian diet is associated with, you know, longer life. And it's the same story. Who are the people who are vegetarians. Generally, they're the people that don't eat at McDonald's. <laughs> they're less likely to eat junk food. They're less likely to smoke and drink Coca-Cola. They're more likely to play tennis on Sunday with their friends and get adequate vitamin D from the real sun. They're more likely to be affluent and have a higher socioeconomic status. So this is why the observational studies are so misleading. And there's really good studies that have been done which shed light on this. One of the best is called the UK Shoppers Study, where they looked at vegetarians in England and if you look at vegetarians in England and you compare them to the general population, they have a longer life. But if you compare them to the general population that is composed of omnivores, people that eat meat, who do healthy behaviors. So if you compare vegetarians to healthy behaving omnivores, they have exactly the same life expectancy. There is no benefit to a vegetarian diet at all. And in some cases, there's a detriment to it because there are tons of studies that show that when you exclude meat from the diet, you end up with all of these nutrient deficiencies that we talked about earlier. So there's great evidence for that. And then I talked about this earlier, so I'll just make sure that I finish this thought. There are actually interventional studies done with meat 
there are controlled studies where they take people in two groups and they have a control group who eats their normal diet and they have an experimental group where they replace, you know, uh, I think it's 200 grams of carbohydrates per day with half a pound, eight ounces of red meat per day. And what do they find at the end? They find lower inflammatory markers and improved insulin sensitivity in the group that ate more red meat and less carbohydrates. Presumably these were grain-based carbohydrates at the end of the study. And I am not, we can talk about my views on carbohydrates. I'm not against carbohydrates, but I think that the carbohydrates they eliminated were probably grain-based carbohydrates, which of course are seeds and the parts of the plants you don't want to eat that are full of lectins. We talked about that earlier. So there are really good interventional studies to show that eating that red meat is not inflammatory, but those are not the studies you hear about in the media because those are very hard to do and they often don't get repeated. So just people, it's really important that people understand the difference between interventional studies and epidemiology and that we educate people on these differences and they can become more savvy health consumers of information. And of course, with the COVID stuff, if we think about this, why might vegetarians look to have better health outcomes in the COVID realm? Well, same thing, right? If you compare vegetarians to omnivores that do healthy behaviors, but that have the exact same COVID outcomes, but of course, these vegetarians are probably the people who are in the sun, who are exercising, they're less likely to have obesity. So this is why it all gets misleading. But the story that the plant-based side always wants to paint is it's the meat. That doesn't make any sense. And it's just so, so misleading. Uh, you know, in the book, again, you know, the, all the science is in there. And if we haven't convinced everyone, at least that uh, carnivore is a possibility, uh, you know, again, like the book just dives right into it. And I think also without touching on it here, uh, you know, again, just talking about the environmental impact of eating nose to tail, free range, grass fed, you know, you spell it out eloquently in the book, but also, and you kind of allude to it as well in the book, like there's so many other fantastic resources that break down the myth that it's, uh, uh, that it's free range grass fed meats that are in the consumption thereof that's destroying the planet. That's can be nothing farther from the truth. That's actually what's going to cause the planet to survive. But um, all right, so so Paul, you took us into major, major deep dives there regarding the science, and you know, again, for the supporting literature, you can just go, just geek out on all that. But uh, all right, so now I'm convinced that uh, this carnivore thing sounds intriguing. Where do I start? So, good question. Um, I'll say, I'll just, I'll unpack it a little bit more for people because there's, there's a few more things that need to be talked about before the whole story is, is, uh, explained. But I will say that I've also got a cookbook coming out. So the cookbook is available for pre-order now on Amazon or anywhere. It's called the Carnivore Code Cookbook. And that's going to be out in December. That's going to be a great place for people to start in terms of recipes and how you do it. But if we go back to the plant idea, I want to, I want to complete that story because if you think about things from the perspective of a plant, I want to talk a little bit about fruit. Fruit, I think, is the difference. And so in the book, I tried to create an easy on-ramp for people toward carnivore or animal-based. And that easy on-ramp includes plant foods. But I talk about this hierarchy of plant toxicity. And I talk about this idea and I say, okay, if you want to go full carnivore and completely eliminate plant foods from your diet, you can do that. And people have massive benefits from that. You need to make sure you're careful with your electrolytes. People can have some issues with ketosis if you're not maintaining your electrolytes. But one of the things that I've found is that if you include carbohydrates from plants in the least toxic sources, it makes it a lot easier for people to come into this realm of animal-based. And that is fruit and honey and avocado, these like parts of plants that are actually fruit. Plants are okay with you eating this. That's why they made a fruit around it. They want you to eat the fruit not eat all the seeds and then deposit the seeds in your poop somewhere so they have fertilizer, right? Or they want you to eat the peach, end up with this very hard shell around the pit and then throw the pit somewhere. This is, plants that really are smart. They've encapsulated seeds and fruit, so they want us to eat the fruit. So if you look at fruit, there really are no defense chemicals in there. There's a whole bunch of literature and I would say a zeitgeist in the nutritional community about fearing fructose. And all I would say is I've done lots of podcasts about this on my podcast, which is Fundamental Health. 
Fructose is not harmful for humans in a whole food matrix, whether that's raw organic honey, whether that's fruit. And I think so many of the studies that are vilifying fructose are done with isolated fructose and animal models. They don't have the same physiology that humans do. They do much more de novo lipogenesis with fructose. They convert much more of it to, to fat than humans do. So don't fear fructose in the whole food matrix, right? Um, so that I think is a great on-ramp for people. And in the book, I outline these five tiers of a carnivore diet and tier one, which is the on-ramp. And I think where most people end up long-term and where I've ended up actually is an animal-based diet. So it's meat and organs. And I'll talk about the importance of organs in a moment and these least toxic plant foods, mostly fruit, honey, avocado, squash. These are actually fruit. We think of them as vegetables, but they're actually fruit. So people can go, um, I'll, I'll give you guys a link at the end where you can email us at Hardened Soil and we'll send you an infographic with all these. There's an infographic we have in the cookbook that I give out for free um, with, with a whole diet plan and where I think about the plant foods in terms of medium, low, and high toxic. So the last piece of the equation in the animal-based realm is something I hinted at, it's the organs. Now, we know our ancestors were not just eating meat. And one of the coolest experiences I had in the last year was I got to go to Tanzania and I spent two weeks living and hunting with the Hadza, some of the last hunter-gatherers left on the planet. And you better believe that when we hunted an animal and killed it, the organs were the first thing to get eaten. And that I think is what has been lost in terms of meeting in our culture. If you go into any supermarket, the majority of supermarkets, you're not gonna see anything but cuts of meat. And muscle meat is super nutritious, but it's only part of the story. If you go to the Hadza, they're gonna eat liver and kidney and heart and spleen, and they're gonna eat the lungs and they're gonna eat every piece of the animal. I ate brains with them and it was delicious. And of course, people are like, oh my God, you're going to get prion disease. That's a whole separate story. I didn't get prion disease yet. I was fine. But we ate, we ate brains with the Hadza because they eat everything. And they're, they're just like we talked about, there are unique nutrients in animal foods relative to plant foods. There are unique nutrients in animal organs relative to the muscle because we do different physiology in our liver and our heart and our spleen and our pancreas and our kidneys and our brain than we do in our muscle. And so if you really want to get all these nutrients, and a lot of those nutrients I enumerated earlier are most robustly represented in foods like liver and heart, things like riboflavin, which is so critical for people with MTHFR polymorphisms. And that's really found most in heart and liver. Um, kidney is a good source of that too. And there's vitamin A in liver in a bioavailable form. And there's coenzyme Q10 in heart and then unique peptides. And so if you really dig into this rabbit hole, the organs are so beneficial for humans. It's incredible. They're magical. And they have these peptides, these short protein molecules that do valuable things in the human body. We were never taught about this in medical school, but they're like, they're almost like the next type of vitamin. Um, you know, things like BPC-157 or you know, so many of these peptides that are actually present in our organs. There's peptides unique to liver. There's peptides unique to heart. There's even peptides unique to the sex organs, like testicle or ovaries that can be beneficial for men or women to eat. So knowing this and seeing how hard it was to convince my family and friends to eat organs, that was why I built Heart and Soil. So I hinted at this earlier. This is my company. And we make these desiccated organ supplements because it's so hard for people to eat liver. My sister was never going to eat liver. Her kids were never going to eat liver and heart and kidney and spleen and pancreas. You can't find it at Whole Foods. So if you can get those organs and you want to eat them fresh, amazing. You're going to thrive. But we, I have a company and we make grass-fed, grass-finished organs from regenerative farms in New Zealand. And we put them in capsules and it's so easy. And so that is, I think, the last piece of this equation. So the on-ramp looks like get, get a good amount of meat. You know, think about one gram of protein per pound of body weight to start, preferably from grass-fed, grass-finished, or generally raised animals. Get organs, either fresh or desiccated. And if you email us at Heart and Soil, the website is heartandsoil.co. You can just send us an email to support. We'll send you the infographic, or I can, I can email it to you, Jack, and we can get it to your folks um, that has all the stuff about animal-based diet. And then as you're starting out, I think most people benefit by including some of the least toxic plant foods, both for variety, texture, and flavor in the diet. But I think that's a pretty easy on-ramp for people, you know? And the question that I always get is, what do you, how do you eat, Paul? Uh, I've got a video about how I eat in a day, but I'll tell you guys what I'm going to eat today. Um, I just got back from surfing, so I haven't eaten breakfast yet. But before I went surfing, I had a couple coconuts and a quarter of a papaya. 
And um, now after this podcast, I'm going to eat about a pound of steak. I think it's going to be about a pound of ribeye with some um, with some mild on salt. I'm going to eat some honey. And that's going to be my breakfast. And I'm going to have about maybe an ounce of liver and probably two or three ounces of heart. That's what I eat for breakfast. And then I kind of repeat the process around dinner time. I eat two or three meals a day. So you could also include things like avocado or squash for more variety. My diet's kind of simple, but does that answer your question? Hopefully that's a little bit of a, a blueprint for people for how they can get into this. It seems intimidating, but there's lots of resources out there for you. The Healthy Heart Show will be right back after we take this quick break to hear from our sponsor. Would you like to drink great tasting coffee that's also good for your heart health? Cardiology Coffee is your answer. This five-star rated coffee is delicious. It's a gourmet coffee that begins with whole organic beans, hand-selected, and carefully roasted. It's tested and certified to be free of pesticides, mold, and other toxins. Cardiology Coffee is great for your heart, and you're going to love how it tastes. Order now online at cardiologycoffee.com. Now back to the Healthy Heart Show. I like that you do the supplementation because it makes it more palatable, a little bit more easy to obtain, and for families to all indulge as well. It's, it's great because you can just take the capsule and empty it, and that's what my sister does. She'll just take the capsule and empty like one or two capsules onto the food that my niece and nephew are eating, which is great. And I was just at a friend's house last night and we put a little bit of, um, a little bit of the desiccated organs into their, their son who's forest food. And so, I mean, you think about how hard it is to get kids to eat healthy sometimes. And so this is, this is a secret, but I want to write a kid's book. And the kid's book is going to be about how you don't need to eat your vegetables. <laughs> I won't give away too much of the plot, but I want to write a kid's book because I want parents to read this and understand like, we could save so much consternation at the dinner table if we weren't like forcing kids to eat broccoli and kale and spinach, which they don't want to eat in the first place because they probably have a good sense. These are bitter and they're not really ideal foods for humans. But I think, you know, if, if kids want to eat liver, great. But if you, if your kids won't eat liver, like talk about getting kids a really good multivitamin, this is going to blow Flintstones out of the water. There's no question that like, this is going to be way better for kids in terms of multivitamin. And that's the way I think of it, you know, in terms of if you give, you know, if you get your kids liver and heart and spleen and pancreas and kidney, which is what we put in our beef organs capsule at Heart and Soil, it's like, man, they're just, it's, it's just, it's really going to help them out in terms of all the nutrients we talked about earlier. All right. Speaking of kids, I got my 14 year old son here, Noah, and uh, uh, he read, he read the carnivore code. Absolutely loved it. What do you, what do you got to say about being a kid here? So I have a, I have a, co- I have a couple questions for you. Um, one of them is, you know, um, I have a sister, her name is Journey. She's three years old and she wakes up every day and she asks for liver and fish eggs. Now, you know, that, that, you know, is because my parents, you know, were very strong believers in carnivore and uh, paleo. So, you know, we've kind of just grown up with that our entire lives. Now, how could that, now, how could other families do the same thing if they're not, you know, used to eating that way? Yeah, we actually just talked about it a little bit with these desiccated organ supplements. You can start with this like powder that you can add to food. But I think that, that you're right that that the earlier you start your kids, the better, because so many of the people I talk to will say liver, that's gross. And liver does have a unique flavor, but man, when I was with the Hadza and we killed an animal, that liver came out and they treated it like pure gold. They would just two hands, gently place it on a rock. Everyone in the tribe gets a little piece. And so I really believe there's so much evidence that as humans, we've treasured these organs and losing the taste for it is tragic because then we avoid it, right? So either giving your kids like a little bit of it, but if your kids are already older, starting out with the desiccated supplements, I think is a great way to do it. And then incorporating really small amounts, maybe even starting with an organ like heart first, if you want to eat the real organ or you want to eat the fresh organ as opposed to desiccated, um, you can start with something like heart. Heart's kind of mild flavor and then gradually move to gamier and gamier organs. If anybody, you know, gets their kids to eat spleen or pancreas, then send me an email and I'll, I'll send you an autographed copy of my book for sure. But uh, that's why we make the desiccated organs. Cool. And then my, uh, my other question was, now I'm 14 and, you know, many other kids my age, you know, they suffer from, you know, acne and other autoimmune diseases. You know, how would carnivore play a role in that? Oh, gosh, it's you hit the nail on the head there. It's so important. This is what really breaks my heart. And a big reason that I do what I do 
I, I strongly believe that a lot of chronic illness, autoimmune disease in, in humans of all ages is related to discordance between our genetics, what, our, what really is a species appropriate diet and our environment, what we're actually eating. And I, I see this, I see kids in puberty, you know, in, in middle school with acne and other issues. And you think, gosh, I, I, I know, I know this is the junk food they're eating. And I know they're eating seed oils, which end up in the pores, which end up in the skin, which end up in the cell membranes, which create the peroxidation in the skin. And that leads to acne. But you know, in medical school, we're never taught acne is soybean oil, you know, or acne is, is potentially a dairy allergy in some people, or acne is a gluten intolerance. We're never taught change the kid's diet. But I know that as much as, you know, young adults love their junk food, I'm pretty sure if you told your peers like, Hey, I bet your acne would get better. If you change your diet like this, they might at least hear it because you can motivate a kid or a young adult you know, by acne, because that's really important how we show up in the world. And I think that so many of these autoimmune diseases that end up manifesting early in, in adulthood or, you know, late in childhood could be improved by modifying kids' diets, by taking out the junk food, the sugar first, of course, the seed oils, but then also taking out things like these highly toxic plant foods that I think could be causing a lot of issues. I mean, how many, you know, it's so funny. I was just sitting with my friends last night, like I was talking about, and we were talking about how they were in Hawaii together. And at that time, one of my friends ate a lot of nuts and they were asking him, why are you so bloated every day? And he's like, I don't know. But he just loves nuts. He's eating almonds and nuts all day. And like how many gastrointestinal issues, how much gas and bloating and constipation, which are really tough things for a, a young adult to deal with, could be solved by modifying the diet in this way. I'll tell you what, like... I fart way less with no kale in my diet. It's so nice. It's so nice not to have gas and to be able to be around people, you know, to be able to go on a date and not just be like, oh, my stomach hurts. I remember this when I was, you know, younger and I'd go on, I'd go to dinner with women and man, I'd, I'd be nervous because I'm on a date or whatever. And then midway through dinner, I'm eating a salad and my stomach just starts to hurt. And by the end of the dinner, I'm just super bloated. And I'm just like, man, all I can do is I just can't wait to get home so I can, you know, not embarrass myself here. So there's so many ways this can be beneficial. And I'll tell you that, you know, eliminating these most toxic parts of plants, the roots, stems, leaves, and seeds will massively improve GI issues as well. It's almost magical. Paul, let me ask you this. You know, it's, um, I, uh, you know, sometimes we get so controversial. There's so much controversy that's out there right now. And and when people, when you introduce this topic to the world, this this very, what would be considered a very controversial topic, like, uh, you know, if you talk to the head of the American College of Cardiology, the former thereof, you know, Kimberly Williams, he is a, you know, well-known vegan. And now everybody's preaching veganism. And now you come out with, you know, with carnivore, which, which I will tell you, and you eloquently spell this out in your book and detail it again, as far as carnivore and being heart healthy, what we're talking about again is cardiac health and wellness. And everything we're talking about is definitely cardiovascular healthy, especially when you read the book and you get down to it. But Paul, what kind of blowback has there been regarding, uh, you know, you know, kind of this this new paradigm uh, shift and and just people kind of gunning for you? It takes a lot to deprogram um, people when we've been kind of. Uh, I don't want to say brainwashed, but you know, there is a strong no, narrative. brainwash is good. Brainwash is good. <laughs> yeah. we, there we, is a strong like narrative. Yeah, yeah, there's a strong narrative, and it, it takes a lot to deprogram that. So, <clears throat> you know, I think the media has a lot to do with it. Like we talked about earlier, mostly everything that's in the media is epidemiology, mostly it's misleading. And it, it's it's been really fun. It's been interesting to like push against it. And, and people slowly realize what's going on. And then it's really satisfying seeing people quote unquote wake up and think, wow, how many other things that I, am I being told that are that are not really founded in science that are based on false narratives? So that, that's really interesting. And it is an uphill battle, but it's so meaningful um, that that I that I really enjoy doing it. And you know, like you said, and we, you know, you were on my podcast in the past, the lipids is really the sharp end of the spear because when you eat more saturated fat from animals, which I believe is hugely healthy, LDL goes up, but triglycerides go down, HDL goes up, people get more metabolically healthy, but Western medicine is so myopic about LDL. And you know this as well as anyone. And so 
it's the blowback is there, but there's you know there's a lot of sayings out there. I think it's Grant Cardone who says you know if you have ten haters, ten haters get you twenty. You know that's how you know you're doing something good. It's never going to be easy. There's always going to be people pressing against you, and that's okay. Um, I think it's I think it's uh, Peter Diamidi, Diam, Diamanides or what's his name. Uh, Diamantes, I'm blank. I'm, I'm butchering his name. I apologize. Has a saying also that like if 99% of the world thinks you're wrong, you're either really wrong or you're going to change the world. So I, I'd like to think that uh, <clears throat> that we're all in the latter camp, and I firmly believe that, and that's okay. You know, I think that's a good message for everybody to hear that like if you're if you feel like you're going up a very steep hill, there's a really good chance that you're going to initiate or be a part of a paradigm shift, which could be really beneficial. Well, I've often said, you know, that uh, 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 giving the gift of health is the best gift you can give to someone. And sometimes, you know, the the individual one on one dialogue that people would have can be very difficult as you're trying to get your point across. I'm trying to get my point across. And that's why giving your your book is a phenomenal birthday gift to anyone. Uh, and the upcoming cookbook is going to be uh, absolutely stellar. I think uh, I, I'm, I'm going to venture to guess that one of the most difficult things you've ever done is write the cookbook. That, that uh, Carnivore Code was probably easiest. The cookbook, because like there's so many limited ingredients and you probably, I'm sure you break it down all through like the different tiers. But once you get to like a tier five carnivore, like it's again, it's it's here's the liver and then you bake it. And then you eat it like that's the recipe. And there's beautiful. I mean, it's it's so simple and the foods are so satiating that you're just again, you don't have to eat anything for hours and hours and hours. Uh, it makes it really, really easy and doable. Yeah, the thing I'll say about the cookbook is it's it's animal based. So if people go to Amazon or wherever and they, they look for it, they'll see that, you know, there's there's I think mean, even on the cover, we have, you know, some fruit. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot you can do when you kind of expand your perspective to meat and organs plus the least toxic plant foods. There's, a, there's so much that you can do. It starts to look like you know paleo, autoimmune paleo, and then this is like a little bit further down the spectrum. Like okay, if autoimmune paleo doesn't resolve or doesn't get you where you want to go, then like go a little bit further. I kind of think of it along that spectrum. You know, paleo is amazing autoimmune paleo and then animal based, which incorporates organs and gets rid of a lot of vegetables that are in autoimmune paleo. But there's still a lot of variety and there's a lot of creative recipes in the book with all kinds of fruit and squash and honey and things like that. So there's a, there's, a, there's definitely colors and flavors. It's much more than just like a carnivore book, which is good. But if people want to do that, there's plenty of recipes about how to just cook meat or organs in there too. Hi. All right. So, uh, you know, again, I uh, love the work, you know, that you've done and, and uh, we'll make sure, you know, of course, in the show notes, we've got all your information in there about, you know, the book, the upcoming cookbook, uh, heart and soil dot co see it, not dot com, but dot co. And again, we'll have the links in there about where to get the absolute best organ supplements in the world and, uh, you know, the quality, the integrity, uh, the, the, uh, the, you know, the beauty and the packaging, uh, you're going to really get the message across. That's really spectacular. Uh, I do want to say this, though, Paul, in the cookbook, because I've been a little critical of, about this with you, is that I'm a massive, massive seafood guy. So are there any re are there any seafood recipes in the book for uh, for the Wolfson family? There are plenty of seafood recipes in the book. And we didn't talk much about seafood in this podcast, but I'm I'm a huge fan of seafood. The only thing I would say, the only caveat, which I'm sure you've talked about with your fans as well, is be aware of the quality of the seafood. Just like you're being aware of the quality of your meat, be aware of the quality of your seafood. Obviously, avoid the bigger fish, which are high in mercury. Um, avoid farm-raised fish, which are going to have PCBs. And just know where, you're, where, know where your seafood is coming from is the thing. And um, I think that... Um, if you, if you choose to include a lot of seafood in your diet, just make sure that you're getting organs as well to complete the picture and maybe just check, you know, check, check your metals. Cause sometimes people will ask, like, can I be, can I just eat seafood? And you can, but I, I, I would recommend checking your heavy metals. If you're only going to include seafood as your meat source, just because the oceans have become, you know, definitely a little bit dirty in certain places, it's totally possible to eat that food. Uh, as a very healthy diet. It's just, that's the only caveat from my perspective. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I love to show my patients and, you know, pictures of are us eating the whole sardine, the whole anchovy, 
Uh, obviously, the whole shellfish, uh, you know, as much as possible. I mean, not the whole shell, but if you open up an oyster, you eat the yeah, um, yeah, entire yeah. oyster. Uh, and I and I do eat the uh, I do eat the prawns and the the shrimp. I tend to eat a fair amount of shell, a fair amount of shell. Um, bone meal. Uh, tell me real quick, how do you? I know you talk about bone meal in the carnivore code. Outside of a supplement and doing bone broths, and again, like the people that are doing bone broths, right? They use either either the water could be a problem, or even the cookware that they're using to to boil this stuff forever that talk about metal exposure that's of, of paramount importance to make sure that you're preparing these foods in uh, good quality cookware yeah so we didn't talk about sort of glycine but i'm sure your audience is familiar with the importance of collagen and so one of the things i talk about in the book is the methionine glycine ratio we don't have to go too deeply into this now but the idea is that if you're the type of person that eats a steak and cuts off all the chewy bits and all the fat, you may not be getting enough glycine, which is this really critical amino acid that is part of glutathione and collagen in the human body. So like two critical proteins. So in that case, you might want to supplement with something like a collagen supplement, um, either hydrolyzed collagen at hardened soil. We have a supplement called Skin, Hair, and Nails that has special collagen from trachea and scapula, like really interesting collagen, really high quality collagen. Um, better, in my opinion, than like hoof and hide collagen. And it's actually trachea and scapula cartilage has been studied by John Pruden and has really interesting powers or it's been associated with like really interesting wound healing and regeneration because it's probably a unique peptides like we talked about earlier that happen that occur in the trachea and the, and the scapula. So there's all sorts of collagenous sources that can be beneficial for humans. But if you are making bone broth, like, like you're saying, don't cook it in something that's aluminum, you know, cook it in a good pan, cook it in the highest quality you can, you know, because that, that could definitely leach stuff in there. And I do think that humans benefit from calcium in the diet and um, there are unique benefits to eating bones as well. There's peptides in bones, there's manganese, there's boron. And when you're, you know, when, when I was with the Hadza, like they're eating the marrow out of bones and you're definitely eating bone flakes, you're getting calcium in your diet and they'll eat the small bones of animals, they'll eat the ends of the bone. So we certainly had calcium even without dairy. Dairy can be amazing for people. I don't tolerate it. A lot of people don't tolerate it. If you tolerate dairy, great. Um, cheese is delicious, you know, uh, colostrum is a great supplement. Um, but if you don't tolerate dairy, I think it's important to consider getting some bone meal in your diet for the calcium. And we also have a, a bone meal supplement at Heart and Soil. We try and connect all the dots, you know? So, yeah. As, I mean, but as your diet got healthier and you converted, obviously you tell the story well in your book. I mean, you have a, you, you, you were vegan for a while, vegetarian, uh, when uh, when you go hardcore carnivores that make it easier for you to tolerate dairy and you personally no despite my efforts i've tried multiple times with dairy it, it always triggers my eczema it makes my beard itch my scalp itch so i think that the casein and the whey and the dairy are just just causing issues for me so i let it go but um dairy i think that you know well-raised dairy whether it's raw preferably raw you know grass-fed grass-finished is is a part of many cultures and I think is prized by many people. It's just that my genetics don't, don't align with it. Uh, you make the case earlier too, as far as, you know, plants being somewhat sentient, uh, you know, beings and uh, the plants feel pain. Like do we, you know, when we pick them, uh, you know, my, my good friend, Dr. Joel Kahn, who's a famous vegan cardiologist and you know, Joel, and he says, he shakes his head. Yes. He's, he's like, I've got the blood of beets on my hands. I, I do. Uh, and he's, you know, brilliant and uh, a witty, uh, a funny person. But, uh, you know, again, like uh, when people, because obviously I, I think ultimately we don't know, but I think you can probably point to some literature that, yeah, these are, these are intelligent uh, 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 organisms that, that we have no idea what they feel or don't feel. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, and when you think about this, we didn't really go down the rabbit hole of regenerative agriculture in this podcast, but monocrop agriculture is a nightmare for the planet, uh, for ecosystems. You know, when, when you monocrop plants, whether you're growing lettuce or beets or whatever, you are tilling the soil, which completely destroys the mycorrhizal networks between plants and fungus, releases a whole bunch of carbon dioxide from the soil into the atmosphere, and destroys all of the ecosystem in the soil, all the earthworms, all the voles, all the mice, all the crickets, all the beetles, 
and then all of the all of the you know the burrows for rabbits and then what about all of the the, the raptors the hawks that that feed on the bugs in that field and then you know you look at actually planting in the field you're destroying the biodiversity of that field and then you may or may not be spraying pesticides there hopefully you're not but you've destroyed the biodiversity of that field it takes generations to recover, it takes probably more than a decade to recover from even one monocropping of a field. And then, you know, you think about the harvesting of that, that field. I mean, this is called bykills. I mean, the numbers are in the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of organisms. So when you're thinking about it this way, you think, wow, like there's a great, there's a great saying, like carnivore is vegan. If, if you're really interested in causing the least amount of suffering, but also being a healthy human, you know, using one life from a cow that lived its whole life eating grass in an environment that was completely safe and happy for it. And then at the end of the life, it dies like all of us do. And then it feeds us, and nourishes us. There's a really important ethical argument to be made there around there's so much more life lost when you destroy an ecosystem. I mean, not to mention the hundreds of thousands, if not millions or trillions of billions. I mean, we're talking innumerable bacteria and communities in the soil that you're destroying with that. So uh, there, there is no, there is no, uh, there, there is no virtue in eating monocropped plants, in my opinion. You know, you're not, you're not causing less suffering. Uh, and, you know, in order for something to live, something else must die. This is the way of life. This is what we've always done as humans. I think it's just important to know where your meat comes from and to eat it respectfully. And I've talked about this on their podcast as well, the importance of hunting. But if you hunt, you know, if anyone hunts and does so with a decent amount of intention and awareness, you will quickly realize that when you see the animal that you are eating, that will change you forever. And it really changes you as a human and reminds you, hey, I'm fortunate. I am lucky to be nourished by this animal. And with that comes a responsibility to be a good human, to be kind, to be considerate. And, and there is a reminder. It's like almost like a sacrament. So there's a lot kind of tied up in there, but I think that we're, we're not always we're not always aware of where our food comes from, whether it's plants or animals. Right. I think that we have been misled in that uh, meat isn't a good choice for the planet and that it's always just about considering your sourcing first and foremost. Uh, I wanted to circle back. You had mentioned a species appropriate diet for humans. And is there species appropriate diets in other species? And what would a species appropriate diet be for humans? Absolutely. I mean, there's a, there's a really great story of lions in captivity in a zoo. And this is, I think this is told maybe by some of the Western Price folks that heard this. I'm not exactly sure what zoo it was, but it's a true story. So they have these lions in captivity. You know, I don't really, I'm not excited about lions in captivity in the first place, but they have lions. Maybe they were sheltered. Let's imagine the lions were sheltered or protected from poachers in a zoo. And in the beginning, the lions were just fed meat. They would just throw the lions meat, like a leg of lamb. And over time, the lions became kind of lethargic and they didn't really want to mate. Like the, the male lion wasn't like mating with the females. And they were like, we're going to lose our population. Like, why don't these lions have libido? Why don't they want to mate? And then they realized like, oh, we're not feeding the lions a species appropriate diet. We're not feeding the lions nose to tail. The lions eat the whole animal. They'll eat the bone. And when they kill an animal, they go straight for the organs. They're going to go straight. I mean, it's kind of, you know, uh, visceral. But, um, you know, they're going to go straight for the liver. They're going to go straight for the, the intestines of an animal. They're going to eat the kidneys. They're going to eat all these things. So lo and behold, they feed the lions a whole animal with the organs. And then again, they're, you know, they're mating. They're mating in captivity again. So there clearly are examples of species appropriate diets. And, you know, one that might land a little closer to home for people is dogs and cats. I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen this hashtag vegan cat, but it's it's freaking animal abuse. It, it, cats are not vegans. And if you feed a cat on plant foods, that cat will slowly die. <laughs> and it's horrible. Now, people try and pretend that their dogs are vegans or vegetarians also. And then you you can do this on talk shows. It's been, you know, it's a shtick that's been done over and over. They'll put meat and vegetables in front of this you know, this virtuous dog that the owners are claiming is so amazing. And the dog goes straight for the meat. So, you know, like there are species appropriate diets for dogs as well. And I think dogs are very clearly animal-based omnivores. Uh, cats are purely carnivorous. And this actually brings up a great um, point that I could have made earlier that I don't believe that humans are carnivores. 
I believe that we're omnivores based on our history. But if you look at the literature in zoology, more than 75% of omnivores either eat either the majority of their diet, more than 70% of the diet of more than 75% of omnivores is either plants or animals, meaning that omnivore generalist is kind of a myth. You know, it, we are clearly as humans, animal-based omnivores. And that's the trick that we talked about in the beginning. That's the, that's the change that made us human. We were plant-based omnivores as primates, and then we started eating a bunch of meat and we became animal-based omnivores and a whole new species emerges. So we are animal-based omnivores. And we see this in our gatherers, we see this in our ancestry. So just like dogs, we are meant to get the majority of our food from animals, animal-based omnivores. If you are listening to this and you have dogs, Watch what happens when you cook a steak around your dog. Watch what happens when you cook liver around your dog. Your dog is gonna go crazy. Your dog will love you forever if you just give them a little piece of your steak or you feed them liver. Or if you really want to feed your dog a species appropriate diet, give them organs, give them animal foods. You know, you can give them a little bit of plant foods, but I would say avoid the most toxic plant foods for dogs as well, because that's what they'll eat in the wild. Wolves, you know, these are animal-based omnivores. So this concept is very, very, well established in the literature. It's just that as humans, we've forgotten this. And then there's this other notion that I will disagree with, which is that, well, maybe vegan is good for some people. Like, no, no, we're all homo sapiens. There's not like a vegan species. It's not like homo sapiens, you know, homo sapiens carnivorous and homo sapiens veganist. No, 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 no. We're all homo sapiens. We all have the same biochemistry. We all have the same enzymatic systems. We all have the same transporters in our small intestine to absorb nutrients and detoxifications in our liver. So there's some variation in terms of these genetics, but we all are basically so, so similar in terms of how we are built. So I really believe um, that as humans, if we elect to avoid animal foods, we are eating a species inappropriate diet. And if we look at currently living hunter gatherers like the Hadza, and we take uh, and we take direction from our evolutionary ancestry that we see that a, a species appropriate diet for humans really looks to be mostly meat and organs, either fresh or desiccated, eaten as the majority of the diet with some of these plant foods that are least toxic. And the same thing is true with the Hadza. I'll just say this. They don't go around like trying to make a salad. They're not like trying to eat pumpkin leaves. They might eat pumpkin leaves or baobab seeds if they're starving and they have nothing else. But there's a clear hierarchy in hunter-gatherer tribes in terms of what foods they prefer. And if you ask the Hadza, what's your favorite food? Meat. What do you dream about? Meat. And they mean meat and organs, right? What's the best day of your life? The day that I hunted and killed the biggest animal, brought it back to the tribe. And when you're out there with them, if they see a hive, they're going to eat the honey and they're going to eat fruit. They're not going to stop their hunting to like pick up a plant and eat it. Like, oh, there's some, there's some like pumpkin leaves on the side. Let's eat some pumpkin leaves. Forget that. They want to eat an animal and they want to eat honey and they want to eat fruit. It's very clear hierarchy. This has been documented by anthropologists like Frank Marlowe, who did his PhD dissertation working with the Hadza. So I would think that that's, that's my perspective. And I think there's a lot of good evidence for that, that an animal based diet is the closest I can imagine to like a species appropriate human diet. Well, you know, plus those TV shows, you know, like Alone, Naked and Afraid, Survivor, like those people are looking for animal food. And the ones who show up there as vegans, they quickly change because they're starving. They don't have a, access to a full salad bar and a farmer's market and all the other stuff, you know, that they have. You know, Paul, this has been uh, absolutely fantastic. There's so much to, uh, you know, information to go over and, and listen, you know, for everyone who's listening, you know, don't forget, just get, uh, get a copy of Dr. Paul's first book, The Carnivore Code, the cookbook's coming up just in time for holiday season and, uh, you know, getting that as, as holiday gifts, birthday gifts that, you know, skip this, you know, uh, shirt and tie or, or the bottle of booze or back in the old days, you would buy someone like a carton of cigarettes who was a smoker, like give, give the informational health and wellness, uh, uh, you know, book, uh, and then of course, visit heartandsoil.co for those you love in your life. And even if you do have access to good, uh, organ, uh, uh, foods, sometimes it can be difficult to get. And then sometimes they can be, uh, uh, not palatable for a lot of people or, or even how do you, you know, if you're interested in, in better libido, male or female, how do you, again, like uh, get testicles and, and ovaries and, that, that is extreme for so many. So, you know, again, Dr. Paul Saladino, thank you so much, brother. Thanks for having me on. We didn't even talk about the, the whole package supplement. But yes, as, as Jack is saying, we do have 
We do have a testicle supplement for men and, a, and an ovary supplement for women, and they're powerful. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, it's great stuff. Thanks for having me on, guys. It's great to be here. Well, well, I think also, too, is that, you know, all these different organ-based supplements, uh, you know, there is, uh, you know, basically you're just eating food. So I don't think you can really go wrong with, with any of it. You're just eating food in the capsule form from the best source in the planet, and you're getting your stuff from New Zealand, which, again, the law of the land is, is to produce, you know, ethically raised uh, animal products, and that's... That's certainly uh, a fantastic. And one thing we didn't talk about, because I don't want to talk about it, which is uh, carnivore and coffee. That's kind of my new uh, mantra. But I'm not going to let you bash uh, coffee because I'm gonna, <laughs> you're going to go eat some uh, uh, animal uh, products. I'm probably going to go have my third cup of coffee. And that's it. Next time. Next time. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about coffee next time. Uh, coffee, I think, is the least, the least of many people's worries. If, if coffee is what you're worried about, you know, you can definitely do carnivore with coffee. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we can talk about coffee next time. Well, I think also, too, Paul, is that, you know, listen, if you're feeling if you're feeling lousy or if you have abnormal you know, numbers and again, like, you know, you and I, we both and so many people focus on the cholesterol numbers, uh, but it's all about inflammation. And honestly, it's, it's to the point right now where I don't even care what someone's lipid numbers are. If if the inflammation on that person is under control and there's other parameters that we look at. But again, like I'm just I'm just so not focused on, on, on that in the majority of people, unless things are really out of whack. And then you just got to dive into other things that are, you know, whether it's something in the environment or has to do with sleep and sunshine and mental health and wellness and all these other, all these other things. But, uh, good to hear that you're not totally down completely on coffee. So that's good. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, before I let you go, I have one last question for you, but you finished your thought. No, I was just going to say that. Remember that coffee is a plant seed. So that's, that's, that's my summary on it. But I, I don't want, you know, I know a lot of people that coffee is the last thing they give up. You know, you can definitely, <laughs> you can definitely do the on-ramp and, you know, you don't have to be perfect with this. Just make the improvements and you'll get, you'll get in the right direction. Awesome. Well, we will share um, all of the information about how to learn more about you and your book and your company, your supplement company. But before we let you go, Maybe it's just wrapped up in all this critical thinking that you pose in your book, which is excellent. Um, but how do you live a heart healthy life? Yeah, so I question I question the norm, and I love doing that because um, when I've you know done this in the past and changed my diet and decreased seed oils, um, I saw my LDL go up, and if I listened to the mainstream. Uh, thinking on that, I would be on a statin right now, which is something that I don't believe is necessary at all. Like Jack was saying, you can, uh, you can see my triglycerides go down, my HDL go up, my fasting insulin go down. And so I think that questioning the mainstream and thinking for ourselves is super important. There's a saying in the crypto community, you know, don't trust, verify. And so I, I definitely try to think outside of the box here. Having said that, um, in my own life, I also choose the best quality foods that I can. I avoid seed oils. I avoid processed sugars. I spend a lot of time in the sun and I do things like this where I get to talk to my friends and that makes me sort of happy. And that's a huge part of it as well. Happy people definitely live longer. Totally agree with that. Uh, all right. I'm Dr. Jack Wolfson. This is the Healthy Heart Show for Dr. Lauren Latanza, for my son, Noah Wolfson. And we will see you next time on another episode of the Healthy Heart Show. Be well, be healthy, 100 your heart. See you next time. That does it for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Healthy Heart Show. Please help us get the word out by liking and subscribing to our podcast and our Facebook page, Natural Heart Doctor. Please show support for our podcast sponsor, Cardiology Coffee, your resource for organic, antioxidant-rich, mold and pesticide-free coffee shipped straight to your door. Learn more by adding at Cardiology Coffee on Instagram and visiting cardiologycoffee.com. This podcast provides materials for information and educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. We encourage you to contact your physician for any of the health issues discussed here.